All right. Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 21st, 2023, and today we're starting it a little bit different. We're going to make this a lighter one. There have been a number of heavy, deep, deep videos in the last few, and this one, we're going to lighten it up and talk on a subject that many people are wanting to understand. I've had some comments sent to me. Could could it be done where a short video is done to help us understand where and why is the pre-trib where it is? And that's what we're going to touch on today. I'm not going to allow myself to go too far down these rabbit trails that that break off and veer off into other directions. The focus is going to be on where the pre-trib escape of the Gentile bride of Christ will be. And I'm going to do it over a short video. Uh, you'll know how long it is now, but hopefully 30 to 45 minutes. And this will be a shareable. It'll be easy to follow. You'll be able to track it all in Scripture and share it with everybody who is interested. The question will remain, is it going to be in 2024? Well, we have other videos as to why I believe with certainty but not of thus saith the Lord, but why I absolutely believe it will be in 2024. Have I believed in previous years? Yes, of course I have, as many have for the last 2,000 years. However, there is reason and purpose and understanding behind it. And this year, in coming 2024, even more so, all based on Jerusalem. So with that, let's get started. And for anybody that's new, I'm just going to briefly mention this. If you're new, you're going to hear things like the differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to. You're going to hear that pre, mid, and post. That It's all true. Pre is to the Luke's group. Mark is mid-trib, great multitude rapture. And Matthew's is the post-trib return of the Lord. These things are all going to take place over a period of time called 14 years and a small portion called above. That portion of time called above is 50 days, and we've got many videos teaching on all of these things, revealing it from Scripture. What we're going to focus on is that beginning, that very first beginning, right at the point of the 50 days about to start, and the pre-trib of the Bride of Christ escapes. I'm going to show why it's connected to what it's connected to, and all of the Scriptures that reveal it, showing we have understood the timing of the pre-trib Bride of Christ and the feast that it's connected to. So with that, if you're new, come to this playlist video because you're not going to understand some of these things and how we got to these revelations. Come and watch the first four videos in this playlist right here, and you will begin in those intros to understand what exactly it is exactly that we're talking about. Or you can go to ministryrevealed.com, like it says right here, and go to the intro page and start with the first four videos right there. So with that, what is this pre-trib all about? Where, where is it really telling us in Scripture? And how can we know what time of year it's connected to? And what does the Scripture tell us about it? So right here, when we go into Luke chapter 21, so many of you guys, you all know this, but this is for newer people and even for older people because you'll be able to share this with others. And hopefully, you'll be able to fully grasp it in a short video. Done. Here it is. And then we can all just focus on the Lord and dig in deeper into his word until that time comes. So in Luke 21, 34, we get this wording that's only found in Luke's discourse, whereas Mark and Matthew's are different. And we're going to touch on those towards the very end. In Luke's, it says from 34 to 36, you know, don't be overtaken with drunkenness and the cares of this of this life so that that day comes upon you unawares. For as a snare shall come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So this is going to affect the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. To what? To escape everything that's about to come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Who is this group of accounted worthy? This group of accounted worthy are the pre-trib bride of Christ, excuse me, that, that, uh, that are taken out at the beginning. It is not the whole church. It is those who are watching and praying, diligently seeking the Lord, love them, have faith. That's who's going first. 
And who is this group? Well, we find them right here, also being spoken of in Luke chapter 20. In Luke chapter 20, starting in verse 34, it says, And Jesus answering and said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy. This, this term, accounted worthy, is used four times in Scripture. Only twice is it found in the Gospels, and both times it's found in the Gospels. It's in the Gospel of Luke to the preacher and bride of Christ. And the other two times, it's counted worthy, not accounted worthy. Okay, So this is the only other time where you find it in the Gospels. And it's directly connected to what Luke 21, uh, 36 was saying, that those who are accounted worthy. So let's see what it says about them. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, comma and, which means there's a group who are going to obtain that world, and there's a group that will obtain the resurrection of the dead. These, this is one group of people added together. Well, two groups of people, but they're in one. They're both part of the accounted worthy. But what you find out is that there's the pre-trib group that is the accounted worthy, and those that are after the comma and that are called the resurrection from the dead. This group is a group from the bride who is chosen from among the bride who is going to be warned just before the pre-trib happens, just, I believe, moments before the pre-trib happens, and they're going to be chosen to remain and serve the Lord when he returns from the wedding for 40 days and then will work during the time of seals, during the tribulation of the seven years of seals. Again, something we've taught on many times. We're going to touch on these guys again just briefly in a bit as well. So the accounted worthy are both those going pre-trib and those chosen to remain who will put their necks on the line, as you guys know, and then they're going to be the ones that are going to be part of the resurrection to rule and reign with them for a thousand years. It says, neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, only used one time in Scripture. Now listen to this, and are the children of God being the children of the resurrection. When you go to read this account in Mark and in Matthew, it's different. There's no accounted worthy. There's no uh, resurrection of the dead as those being a part of this accounted worthy because the term isn't there. Nor, of course, will you find equal unto the angels with this terminology, nor will you find that they are the children of God. When Romans says that we are the children of God, that we will be heirs, co-heirs with Christ, he's talking to the pre-trib group. And when he's talking about ruling and reigning for a thousand years, he's talking to this group who's going to be part of the resurrection from the dead who will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. They are the children of God. These are the ones in Christ, spirit-filled. So you're seeing now that the accounted worthy are clearly a part of a group that are going to take part in this otherworldly thing, which is the third heaven to go and be with the Lord. So let's follow this along. Remember what I said, that when we go into the story of the wedding in Luke chapter 14, we see the story of the wedding. And it says, you know, when you're invited to the wedding, don't sit in the highest room. Now, why is this a big deal? Because there's a wedding story in, in Luke and there's a wedding story in Matthew. There's no wedding story in Mark. That's because there's a pre-trib Gentile bride wedding and there's a post-trib Jewish wedding. And in this wedding, it's spoken of differently than the one that you find in Matthew. So this one being to the pre-trib bride, it says when you're invited, don't go sit down in the highest room there. And then get embarrassed if a more honorable person comes and you were sitting in their seat. But go and sit in the lowest room. And if you're in the lowest room and there's a special seat for you higher up, somebody will come and get you and bring you there. We've talked about this many times over the years because it's so awesome. Imagine you get to the third heaven and you're at the wedding and you know to sit in the lowest room. And then there's an honorable spot. Somebody comes to get you and brings you higher. This is speaking prophetically to the end of days. This group who is going are those that are the accounted worthy of that world. This, this is the group going to the third heaven. And then we see only in Luke's gospel, after this Gentile wedding, we see a banquet being mentioned. 
There's no banquet mentioned after the wedding in Matthew. This is only found in Luke's. And that's because this is the wedding that the Lord, the uh, sorry, this is the banquet that the Lord is going to have with that group that, remember we said those who are deemed accounted worthy of that world, comma, and the resurrection of the dead? That's because when he returns from the wedding, after seven days, on the eighth day, he's returning from the wedding to have a meal with that specific group of people who he said are going to serve him, who are going to then put their necks on the line and be the ones who will be part of the resurrection of the dead who are going to rule and reign with them during the millennial reign. And we see it right here about them. In Luke 14, 13, it says, But when thou makest a feast called the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. It's this group part in the resurrection. And who is this group? Remember, this isn't now the wedding. This is after the seven-day wedding, okay, that he's now had this meal with them in this banquet that he said he would have. When did he say he would have this banquet? He told us right here in Luke chapter 12, verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and you yourselves like men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, you may open immediately and he will come and sit and serve them and eat with them. This is that same group who will take part in the resurrection. This is that group. When he returns from the wedding, he is going to have a meal with. But you see, he's warning them right before he goes to the wedding. This is a prophetic picture of him telling this group, who is a part of the entirety of this Gentile bride group, that he is forewarning, hey, you're not going because I am choosing you. You are going to serve me and work for me and follow me during 40 days. And then when the tribulation is, you're going to help during the time of the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos to bring in the great multitude, okay? So we saw the group goes at the beginning. Another group is told to wait. He returns from the wedding, and now he's going to have a meal and hang out with these people. So we can see that there's these two groups, these two portions from among them. Now we go to Luke chapter 9. Let's go see another pre-trib conversation taking place. We see in Luke chapter 9, verse 27, it says, we can even start in 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come. This is that pre-trib Gentile bride going to the wedding, never having tasted of death. And look at what you see in, in 928 of Luke. And it came to pass about an eight days after these sayings. This is him now coming eight days because on the eighth day, he's coming after the seven day wedding and he's coming on the eighth day. When you go to the intro series, you will see as you continue further through, you'll see the typologies in the transfiguration, the resurrection and in the triumphal entry, all prophetic pictures of pre, mid, and post, or of his coming for 40 days after the pre, of his coming at the end of the sixth year of seals, and his coming feet down at the end of the sixth year of trumpets. So we're seeing these pre-trib pictures clearly being spoken about. But my number one favorite, as many of you guys know, is where it all began with the 14 years after the pre-trib and post, Luke, Mark, and Matthew started to be revealed six years ago. And that is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. It is a prophetic insight. It's not just what took place then. You have to look with the end time understanding. Paul says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. This is the above I was telling you about. This is that 50-day portion. So right at the beginning, right as it's about to start, this above 14 years, which is the 50 days, what happens? He says, in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So this isn't the rapture of the great multitude. This is the one that's like the rapture. This is the pre-trib, like a rapture, taken to the third heaven. This is that group that is not going to taste of death. This is that group that is going to stand before the Son of Man, the accounted worthy. 
And you see right here, if this was meant just to be as what it was Paul and his experiences, why does verse three say, and I knew such a man. You see, the first one was a man in Christ, which Paul was. And then he says, then I knew such a man. So kind of like this first one. So you're going to say Paul was in Christ, and then he refers to himself as not really in Christ anymore? No. This is your mid-trib great multitude rapture, and it says how he was caught up. This is the was caught up great multitude mid-trib rapture. They go to paradise. So again, here is your pre-trib picture in the portion called above before the 14 year starts. And it is the revelation that we've taught on for years, which is the 50 days that comes first. So when is this connected to? Who is this connected to? Many of you guys know this. Even other watchmen understand this part that some will tell you that it's being like Enoch. Others will tell you it's like being like, like um, uh, um, Elijah <laughs> because neither of them tasted of death. However, it's not like Elijah. Elijah is connected to the mid-trib great multitude rapture, whereas Enoch is the pre-trib Gentile bride picture. And we read it right here in Hebrews 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we need faith, obviously, before we can come to please the Lord. For he, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Search, investigate, search him out diligently. That's what we've been doing here for over six years. This is that pre-trib group who will be like Noah. Uh, sorry, who will be like Enoch. So now the question is, we have one that never tasted of death like Enoch, and bang, he was gone. We have another one in Elijah who went up in a whirlwind after these other events. We know that that one's already pre-trib, and we've taught, I mean, a uh, mid-trib, we've already taught on it. So knowing that Enoch is pre-trib, knowing that many others believe that he's pre-trib as well, what more can we find out about him? Well, of course, if you go to Genesis uh, chapter 5, we see that Enoch lived for 365 years, and we have a prophetic picture of days as years and years as days. We see this in Scripture talked about all the time. We've got many teachings on it. We've shared on it as well. And it says Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. OK, so he lived 365 years, a prophetic picture of days. And if he lived 365, then it's understood that he was taken at the time of his birth. So the question then, be then becomes, well, when was Enoch taken? The answer is many people already know this. It's been passed down through generations and it's in ancient writings all over the place that he was taken at Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Now, this is where it gets confusing for many people because everybody's been told that the Feast of Weeks is Pentecost, and it 100% is not Pentecost. Some people have already understood this, but most people don't get it. It is seven Sabbaths for Shavuot or Feast of Weeks that come first. At the end of those seven weeks, those seven Sabbaths, that is is when the pre-trib happens. Then you count 50 more days to Pentecost. But the what we have to now know is, well, how do we understand this in Scripture? What does it tell us in Scripture about Shavuot? What does it tell us about the Feast of Weeks? Because if we listen to what the world tells us, we would have to believe it's the 6th of Savan, 6th to the 7th, but they usually they'll tell you it's the 6th of Savan. And how they do that is they will count 50 days from right here. But that is not what Scripture tells us to do. Scripture tells us to count seven Sabbaths and then number 50 days. <laughs> and we can prove it. And we're going to show it to you. We're going to prove how you can understand it. But the question is, is this where it should be? 
Or if we do seven Sabbaths, if you count seven Sabbaths, then here's your resurrection day. The Sabbath is really the 22nd, the 29th, the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd, the 29th, and the 8th. So this is your seventh Sabbath. If you're counting from Nisan at resurrection time. So could this be possibly Feast of Weeks and then counting 50 more days to Pentecost in 2024 or in any year that it might happen, although I believe it is 2024? Would this be where it is? Well, I'll tell you, we are most certainly going to be watching for this period of time, no doubt. Absolutely going to be all eyes peeled. But do I believe that's where it is? No. And I'm going to show you why from scripture, from harvests, <clears throat> from the time that Enoch was around, it's not actually here. And now I'm going to explain that to you as to why. So we know the scripture tells us that the pre-trib is going to happen at the true feast of weeks. So let's have a look and dig into this a little bit further. Something we've shared on many times over the last several years. In the beginning of creation, it wasn't where it is right now. Okay? Right now, month one of Nisan is in April, or Nisan is in um, uh, um, Pisces. Okay? But in the beginning, it wasn't in Pisces. It was where the month of Sivan now is. And back in those days, it was Taurus. Okay? So you have Taurus is the third month, which is the Hebrew month of Sivan. And back at the beginning, this is where it was. So back in Noah's days, it was in Taurus when the count began. Wait until you see these connections, because it connects to the was and to the is, and it brings them together. All revealed to us in Scripture. So we see to the early Hebrews, Taurus was the first constellation in their zodiac and consequently was represented as the first letter in their alphabet. Well, of course, that's why it's the first letter in their alphabet. You see, Jesus is called what? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In Hebrew, it's the Aleph and the Tav. You guys know what an Aleph and Tav is, right? There's your Aleph. It's the ox. We've blown this up in the last several videos, something we've known about for a while, but now it has exploded in clarity. So he is the ox and he is the Tav represented by the cross. So in the beginning, ox, you see? So now when we go to the beginning <clears throat> and we go to Genesis chapter one, because in the beginning, there is the end for the, in the end, the, the beginning is there, right? So, Genesis 1.1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, when people read this, they just think this is the beginning of everything and that God, Jesus, created it all. Well, listen to what it really means, what it's really telling you. In the beginning. Who's the beginning, guys? Who's the beginning? Jesus is the beginning, of course, right? He is the beginning and the end. He is the Aleph and the Tav. So, Jesus is the beginning. So in Jesus, God the Father created the heaven and the earth because everything was given to Christ by the Father to go and create it all. So if we look at this word beginning, it should be able to give us some insight if it was Jesus. Look at what it is. It's the Hebrew word 7225, first beginning, specifically a first fruit. So what is this 7225? Well, lo and behold, we go to Leviticus chapter 23. And we go to the feast of first fruits. Here's the feast of first fruits. What is the feast of first fruits? It's resurrection day. It's resurrection day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And resurrection day was or is to us the 16th day of the first month. But this is where it is for us now. In the beginning, the Feast of First Fruits, the resurrection of the 16th day of the first month of where it is now, wasn't there in the beginning. It was in Taurus, which means this was the 16th day 
of the first month in the beginning when all of creation started. Sivan is the month of Taurus, and the 16th is the beginning of creation. So he is the beginning. He's the ox. It happens in the ox, which is the month of Sivan, and it was the time of first fruits, which is the 16th of the first month, or which is now the third month. So you could see when Christ created and all of it started in the beginning, it started on the Feast of First Fruits. When did it all begin for us? At the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the first month, 16th day. Pretty wild, right? Well, it gets even better. <clears throat> because as we go into this, we find out that where Jesus fulfilled it because of the sun's movement, right? So we're tracking with the sun. When Jesus fulfilled it, he fulfilled it in what was the first month at his time. Now, from when Christ's death and resurrection, now we're even one month further out because of the movement of the sun that is sped up. So we're now a full two months, which is really what? When people say, well, first month, the third month, that's three months. Well, no, it isn't. Because from the 16th of one month, you're halfway through one, you go halfway through the second, that's one month, and you go halfway through the third, that's two completed months. <clears throat> so from the first to the second, from the same date to the same date, is simply two months. And so when Jesus fulfilled it based on where the sun was, he fulfilled it on their Hebrew first month, 16th day. In the beginning of creation, it was where Taurus was, 16th day, first month. So you might think, well, based then on where we are nowadays and the sun being where it is now with two months off, maybe the count should begin here for the seven Sabbaths, which would take us to right here after the end of seven Sabbaths. <clears throat> but that's not the case either. And I'm going to prove to you why. You see, what comes next? We're looking for the Feast of Weeks now. So if we're looking for the Feast of Weeks, and we go to Leviticus chapter 23, and we see the Feast of Weeks. It says, uh, from the day that thou brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall you number. You see, now you have to mark or count 50 days. Not the 50th day, but 50 more days. Okay? So what's going to happen after those seven Sabbaths when you start to then count the 50 days? And you shall offer a new meat offering. And what are they? Two wave loaves of 10th deals. They are the bread baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. But they're not the same first fruits as Jesus was. These are the first fruits of the crop. 1061, different than the 7225. So what is this group? How can we understand where they are? Why, if the count is now here because this is where the sun is, why wouldn't it count from here and take us to the seventh Sabbath right here as the pre-trib escape? Okay, we're, this is what we're going to break down now. Because we can understand that, that um, the Feast of Weeks is connected to the first fruits of wheat. It is so important that people understand it is the first fruits of the wheat harvest that is the pre trib bride of Christ. And we see it right here in Exodus 34 22. And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, right? Shavuot, the feast of weeks, of the first fruits. You see that? Same one. Of the first fruits of what? The wheat harvest. So now we can understand it's established that the feast of weeks of the first fruits is the wheat harvest. When we now go to Deuteronomy 16, in Deuteronomy 16, we see that there are three feasts to the Lord. Passover, Feast of Weeks or Shavuot, and Feast of Booths, Tabernacles. What people have to understand is here in this ministry, we have revealed the revelation of pre, mid, and post in the three feasts of the Lord of Deuteronomy 16, 
not maybe, not kind of. It is 100% a done deal. And this right here, the seven weeks, the seven Sabbaths, is to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Then you have the seven days as seven years of unleavened bread for the great multitude rapture. And you have the seven years or of the seven days as tabernacles to the seven years of trumpets. It's the 14 years that begin after the above 50 days that begins at what? After the seventh Sabbath, then the 50 days begin. But the pre-trib will be taken out at the end, at the end of that seventh Sabbath day. Listen to what it says in Deuteronomy 16, 9. Seven weeks shall thou number unto thee. Begin to number seven weeks from such time as thou beginnest to put the sickle to the corn. Well, I just showed you in Deuteronomy that this corn isn't just any old grain. This corn, I just showed you through Deuteronomy, uh, th sorry, through, yeah, uh, no, through Exodus chapter 34, that the first fruits of the Feast of Weeks is connected to wheat. So we can prove that this wheat is wheat or that this corn is wheat. And I can show you by going even into the New Testament in Luke chapter 22, we see when Satan wanted to sift them, wanted to sift Peter, it says he wanted to sift Peter as wheat. What is this wheat? Especially wheat, corn, wheat. Because corn is another reference for wheat. And this has thrown many, many people off. It is the first fruits of wheat. Now, what we're going to have to do is establish, well, when is wheat? What wheat are we talking about? So the other thing I want you to understand here is that you see no reference of 50 more days. You see, in Leviticus 23, it says, then shall thou number 50 days which means after the seventh Sabbath, you're going to number or count an additional 50 days. Those 50 days are what bring you to true Pentecost. And what is Pentecost? It's the time of new wine, which means from the Feast of Weeks, uh, 50 days earlier should be where the harvest of the wheat is done and that they can grind it and make what? Well, according to Leviticus 23, that is where they grind it and they make two bread loaves with, with leaven, which means those who have the sin, right? Which is us. That's why we can't be uh, the other first fruits because it's without leaven. That's Christ. So now the bread is baked with leaven. So now we need to understand, well, which wheat is that? Where is the actual true feast of weeks? And to understand it, that means that 50 days after this time, when the harvest is over and they make that bread, that means 50 days later is when wine should be ready and it should be the time of new wine. So we can see this connection now to weeks, first fruits of the wheat harvest. It's the feast of weeks. You see, Enoch was taken at it. It is all pre-trib feast of weeks. So now, what about wheat? This is where it gets really important because the Jews have missed this. There has always been two wheat harvests. And what we read is that spring wheat is sown in the spring and is harvested in the fall. You see, that would be too late, wouldn't it? Winter wheat is sown in the fall, lives through winter, and is harvested in the summer. It is harvested in the summer. Well, do you know what happens? Let me show you on a calendar. They're trying to tell you that the wheat starts to get harvested right here. That they start to put the sickle to the wheat and they count their seven Sabbaths, which they claim brings it to here. But really, if that's where the seven Sabbaths were, it would bring you to here. Do you know there is zero, zero wheat being harvested from April through June? There is no wheat harvest. It, it doesn't exist. It's only growing. The spring harvest, the spring wheat, I should say, is only starting to be planted. So there's no way you're putting the sickle to the wheat at the time of, of unleavened bread and reaping it here. That's for the spring wheat. That proves the spring wheat is absolutely impossible. But what about 
winter wheat. Well, winter wheat is planted in the fall and it grows all it, it grows and then it takes root, spends some time during winter, and then during the spring it starts to grow and it is harvested in late summer. It's not even summer yet. It's just spring. It's not going to grow. Wheat's not going to grow in 50 days. Wheat doesn't begin its harvest, like start to come up till about right here. It hasn't reached the point. It's still all green. It's nowhere near harvesting right here. It's not until late July, so mid-ish July to about mid-August, when wheat is literally ready to begin harvesting. You see? That's why it tells you harvest it in summer. So what you have to understand is that if we are, if the pre-trib is first fruits of the weed harvest of the Feast of Weeks, and it says from when you begin to start putting the sickle to the corn, which is the wheat, and there's no way you start doing that, <clears throat> Till sometime around late, late May to early June is because that's just when it's starting to come. Then where do you get your seven Sabbaths? It's impossible to do it before wheat even starts coming up. You follow what I'm saying? We know that it takes about four months total, which brings you to very late July to early mid-ish August. Summer, summer, in the midst of summer is when winter wheat is harvested. And lo and behold, look what happens when you understand this. There's a festival that's been going on for several centuries, like over a 1, thousand, fifteen hundred plus years called Loaf Day. Okay, Loaf Day. It's observed every year on August 1st. Now, does that mean, oh, August 1st is when the true uh, Feast of Weeks is? It's got to be August 1st? No. Why did they choose August 1st? Because it's always in this time frame. So they chose the most fitting time frame of August 1st. Why is it a big deal? Because this is when the harvest is ripened and they bring in the sheaf of the first of the wheat. It says it was probably the day when loaves Baked, this is the baked with leaven from the first of the wheat harvest. Bless the church. They brought in loaves of bread every year and still do it in countries all over the world on August 1st from what? From winter wheat. Because you see, winter wheat can be used immediately. There is no waiting after it's harvested. Once it's harvested, they can break it up, grind it, and they bake bread with it right away, which means that winter wheat or the harvesting and the time of first fruits has to be somewhere from late July into mid-ish August of any given year. For this to be true, we have to figure out, well, how is that counted, right? Well, I just showed you for one, it can't begin from right here. Because it has to end when the seven Sabbaths are done, which is right here. And this is just the beginning. This is just the time frame right in here when they would start to put the sickle to it. So there has to be seven Sabbaths. Well, if this is true, which means this right here is what? It's not the true Feast of Weeks. If we remember now, this was a count we were doing based on this being where it actually is now. but it doesn't work because there is no wheat ready. So if we do it from where it was in the beginning, in Taurus from in the beginning, and we do the seven Sabbaths from here, look what happens. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's your seventh Sabbath. And when is it? Well, because there was a, a, an additional month added in 2024. Otherwise, it would be up here. It always falls within this time frame. And guess what? This is literally the time frame of the end of the winter wheat harvest when it's brought in, ground, 
and they make loaves baked with leaven. Precisely as Leviticus 23 said, and precisely the time frame with wheat from Exodus 34 and Deuteronomy chapter 16. And Leviticus said from this point that this August 12th of 2024, when the two loaves would be brought in at the end of the seventh Sabbath, then 50 days would begin. Then number 50 days. This is the above I was telling you about in the beginning. So from August 13th, if you count 50 days from the 9th of Av, you end up coming to the 29th of Elul, October 2nd of 2024. And it's what? It's the 50th day. And then you end up on the day and hour no one knows, which is the Feast of Trumpets. This would be the beginning of the 14 years after the 50 days. Well, how is that possible? Alan, isn't that the end of 50 days where the new wine should be? Well, you guessed it, right? You guessed it. It has to be the time of new wine. So that means, <clears throat> as I was saying earlier, if this is where the seventh Sabbath ends, it has to be where there's an actual wheat harvest ended. Correct? Check. There it is. Seven Sabbaths, wheat baked with leaven. Where Enoch was taken in the prophetic was time frame of where it counted from. Which means Enoch wasn't really taken here in Savan. This is where it is now. But where would this be when it was the time of Enoch? There you go. You see, where it was from the beginning, we're going from the beginning as it will be in the end. And so if this is where wheat was, remember what I said? That means 50 days later, after this seventh Sabbath, if you count those 50 days, it has to be where the new wine is. And guess what, brothers and sisters? That's exactly what happens. Do you know it is impossible where they tell us Pentecost is? Because they tell us Shavuot, Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Remember, they all say this is the same thing. Nowhere on God's green earth is there a grape harvest and new wine being made in the middle of June. The grapes haven't even started really growing yet. It doesn't exist. Do you want to know where the grapes are actually finished? They're anywhere from mid-September, mid-late September into early mid-ish October. Always, 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 always. Check it out right here. Here's one for you. Some pro places that prolong the season, season, others have a very short window of time when grapes must be picked. Generally speaking, mid-September to mid-October is a safe bet if you want to see harvest celebrations in full swing. Which means there is no way you could say a count from Nisan on the Hebrew calendar is going to give you a seven Sabbath 50 day count to a weed harvest and a grape harvest. It doesn't exist. And the scriptures have told us that is when the winter wheat or when the wheat is being harvested, when those seven Sabbaths come to an end and they bake bread with leaven, that they bring it into the house of the Lord. And every year, this is the end of the winter wheat harvest. Do you know why it's not the spring wheat? You saw what it said for the spring wheat? The spring wheat is planted in spring, and it's not harvested till fall. So the spring wheat, it's not even ready till the time when the grapes are being harvested. But the spring wheat cannot be used until the following year. It cannot be used until the following year on the second day of unleavened bread. You see how it is impossible that the seven Sabbaths of the Feast of Weeks cannot be one connected to spring wheat? Scripture told you it has to be seven Sabbaths from when you put the sickle to the wheat. And then it'll be another 50 days to wine. You cannot do this any other way. And look at what it gives you. You have the pre-trib on the 8th of Av. So whatever year it's going to happen, get ready for the 8th 
of Av of that year, which I believe with all of my heart and all of Revelation that it's going to be 2024. Then begins the 50-day count. We know from Scripture that the 50 days will begin with an attack on Israel in two northern places that I believe will be Haifa and Tel Aviv. That will begin the 50 days. When does the Son of Man return? After the wedding on the eighth day, which would be the 16th of Av. He'll fulfill his 40 days of the Son of Man. There'll be not many days. And then the Holy Ghost will come at what we call Acts 2.0, which is Pentecost. They get the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And what happens after the 50th day? The second attack, this time on Jerusalem, and it destroys Jerusalem. The Jews flee, and the 14 years begin at the Feast of Trumpets. How do I know this? I know this from something we've been teaching here in this ministry for over five years. It says in Zechariah chapter 7, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those past, all past tense, those 70 years, did you at all do it unto me? When Jerusalem was inhabited, when the cities thereof and round about, when men inhabited the south of the plain. When, when, when. It's all past tense. Why? Because we know from the fifth attack, from the first month of the, the from the first attack in the fifth month, which is the ninth of Av, to after the 50th day of the Holy Ghost, then there's the attack on the first day of the seventh month. What is the first day of the seventh month, brothers and sisters? It's the day and hour no one knows. It's the Feast of Trumpets. And when we came to Isaiah chapter 9, as I bring this in here, when we come to Isaiah chapter 9, we got the revelation that there was a light affliction in two northern cities in Israel, Zebulun and Naphtalin, in the was historically. It is a prophetic picture to the two northern cities being attacked in the, at the beginning of the 50 days. We know the Son of Man returns after the wedding, which will be after this light attack and this short war that breaks out in northern Israel. And then who comes? For unto us a child is born. So you would think, well, remember what I was saying earlier? You would think, well, it's got to be connected then to Jesus' birthday, right? So if Jesus was born on the 15th to the 16th of the third month, you see, we know Jesus was born on the 15th, 16th day of the third month. And look at where it is now. We know in the creation at the beginning, it was right here in the beginning. They've now merged to be the same place because the calendars have gone off. But this was the beginning, and this was Jesus' birthday. Well, guess what? You would think, well, you see, why don't we then keep it right here as the seven Sabbaths from Nisan? And then here comes the Lord on the eighth day to begin his 40 days, the 50 days having begun right here. Well, there's a very, very important, wild piece of revelation from Isaiah chapter 9 that confirms this all to us. Because here's the light affliction that will happen after the free trip escape. Northern Israel, two cities destroyed, and a short war breaks out for about a week. Then the Son of Man shows up. Even though it looks like his birth, he's here for 40 days because it's a picture of his 40 days connected to his birth. When it's over, at the end of 50 days, here comes Syria, and they will destroy Jerusalem. Just as we've shown, which is the connection to the fifth and the seventh month, the first attack and the second attack that removes them from the land. So why was this such a big deal? Because Matthew chapter 4 reveals that what we read in Isaiah 9 was confirming this was fulfilled in the is when Christ was here. And we know now the revelation in the prophetic is to come that the Isaiah 9 was the picture of the attack coming at the beginning of 50 days, right after the escape, and then the Son of Man, when he shows up to fulfill his 40 days, even though it appears in Isaiah 9 that it's connected to his birth, we know it's not actually connected to his birth, which is that 15th, 16th of the third month. And how do we know it? Because of what Jesus fulfilled in Matthew 4. It says, Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed from Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt at Capernaum, which is in the east coast of Zebulun and Phthalon. That, he, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, In the land of Zebulun and Naphtalim, 
by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people that sat in darkness saw a great light. You see, this is the fulfillment from the was that he fulfilled in the is and the revelation of the was and the is and the is to come give us incredible insight here. Why? Because of this right here. John was now cast into prison when Jesus fulfilled this, when Jesus walked through there. What does it mean prophetically? Well, we know from history records that John had been cast into prison for about 10 months, which means, as we've known for years here, that John was around with Christ from his baptism for about two months before he was cast into prison. Did you catch it? Two months. Two months before John was arrested and then put into prison for 10 months. Two months, which means what Isaiah 9 is telling us that sounds like it's going to be connected to the time of his birth didn't actually get fulfilled at the time of his birth or at his birthday, but it got fulfilled two months after his birthday. So if we go to Jesus's birthday, which is right in here, third month, 15th to the 16th of the third month, and we know that it's actually two months later, approximately, when he fulfilled it, and we go two months later, here's one month, here's two months. Lo and behold, we have the revelation understood in Isaiah 9 from the pre-trib escape of the 8th of Av, the first attack that happens on the 9th of Av, like all of these other attacks that have happened on the land. It's a battle that lasts, a short war that will last in northern Israel in two cities. It'll last for about a week. And then who shows up? The Son of Man shows up two months later. Two months later. Do you see how it all connects directly to the harvests? It ends up giving us account from the seventh Sabbath pre-trib. On the 12th of August, the 8th of Av, to then begin the 50 days on an attack that is the historical day of Israel's attacks. And then he returns on the 8th day, which is two months, as the scriptures revealed, two months after his birthday, when he had fulfilled it in the is from the was. And he's here for 40 days. He'll finish those 40 days around the 29th of September. And then the Holy Ghost comes not many days later. Three days later, you have the Holy Ghost when what? When actual grape harvest is complete. And what happens when the grape harvest is complete? It's the celebration of new wine. Do you know that that's what Deuteron or Acts chapter 2 tells us? That Pentecost happens at a time when there's new wine, which is why they were being accused of being drunk on new sweet fermented wine, which is the sweet wine. It happens every year between mid-September to mid-October. And it just so happens, Elul 29 every year is true Pentecost. Why? Because look at what happens next. The day and hour no one knows. This is when Ishmael came and brought the second attack 50 days later on Jerusalem that now will destroy Jerusalem and they will flee. And this will be, be the beginning of the 14 years. The day and hour no one knows. Trumpets is either on the first or the second day of Tishri. And why, as I bring this to a close, why is this so important? Watch this. In Luke's discourse, which is the portion called above, you will notice that there is no mention of the day, of that day and of that hour that no one knows. When you go to Mark's discourse, it tells you when the seals, six, first six years of seals come to an end, they see the Lord coming in the clouds at the end of the sixth year, first six years of seals. What do we read? But of that day and hour knows no man. The word, the, the meaning of that day and hour is the Feast of Trumpets. So what do you get? Six years. After the beginning of the 14 years on the day and hour no one knows, the Lord is seen coming in the clouds at the end of the first six years of seals. What about when you go to Matthew? You go to Matthew chapter 24. So that's when he's coming in Mark, when he's coming for the great multitude mid-trib rapture. 
at the end of six years of trumpets, right? Uh, sorry, at the end of six years of seals. And the great multitude rapture happens in the seventh year of seals. And look at what happens in Matthews. Coming of the Son of Man, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is at the end of the sixth year of trumpets, which is the end of 13 years total tribulation. And what does it say? But of that day and hour knows no man. So why is it important? Because it starts on the day and hour no one knows. Six years later, he's coming in the clouds on heavenly Mount Zion on the day and hour no one knows. And after the 13 years of tribulation total, or the end of the sixth year of trumpets, he's coming on the day and hour no one knows. Which means you could not possibly go from account that begins in Nisan and come to a place where there is no wheat that's been harvested, where there are no grapes that is ready, and try to say that this is now when everything is going to begin because this is not only the Feast of Weeks, but it's also Pentecost. There is zero wheat, there is zero grapes, and there is zero day and hour connection that comes to it. And we have scripture that told us that it would be from the fifth month that they were in the land to the seventh month because one attack is at the fifth month, ninth of Av. The second attack is on the seventh month, first day of the month, on the day and hour no one knows. And in between are the 50 days when the literal wheat harvest of the winter wheat is complete and brought in and been made into loaves with leaven. And the 50 days that follow begin with attack, end with an attack after Pentecost, which is where actual wine of new wine is celebrated and complete and ready. And it connected directly to two months later, telling us that it's not literally connected to Jesus's birth, but where it is from account two months later after John was cast into prison. Brothers and sisters, I believe with all of my heart, and in fact, I will tell you that I believe unequivocally, regardless of the year. So I'm not saying 100% 2024, but I am telling you 100% with everything of revelation that, we've, that has been made known to us over the last six years and change, that the 8th of Av is the pre-trib escape of the Gentile bride of Christ in the year that it's going to begin. I have proven it with scripture. I have proven it with, with, with history. And I have proven it with literal harvests taking place on the earth and how they have been observed for hundreds and over 1,500 years. This is the pre-trib at the 8th of Av. This is the beginning of the 50 days on the 9th of Av. The 16th of Av is the beginning of the 40 days of the Son of Man two months after the time of his birth. And the 29th of Elul is true Pentecost. And the 14 years of tribulation will begin at the day and hour no one knows of that year, for which I believe the revelation has made known that it will be 2024. And you put this together with all the events that are taking place around the world, and it becomes more and more clear that 2024 is highly probably the year which will make August 12th, the 8th of Av, the pre-trib escape of the Bride of Christ, just as we've been sharing for the past year and change, but especially specifically for the past six, seven, eight months. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. I pray this blesses you and that you will understand it, take the time, discern it, and share it with others. In Jesus' name, amen.